Israel are engaged in some of the most intense fighting we have seen in the Middle East in recent history. Israelis have said that they hope that this kind of fighting will lead to eventual unrest inside Iran and perhaps the overthrow of the supreme leader. Predicting unrest is very hard. As a former intelligence officer, I know that we look at this a lot. It's very difficult to suss out when a protest movement might actually turn into more. In a closed authoritarian regime like Iran, it is even harder. Getting good information out, very difficult. Analyzing it, also very difficult. So we're here today to talk about some alternative methods that might help us identify what's going on inside Iran, whether it might turn into something that could eventually lead to the downfall of the regime. So I'm Emily. Uh, I'm the Vice President of the Defense and Security Department here at CSIS, and I have with me Ben and Errol, who are going to talk through some of these methods. Over to you, Ben. Thanks, Emily. So Ben Jensen, I'm the director of the Futures Lab. You can think about us as a mad scientist in being. Um, what I want to orient everyone to, as Emily said, is how do we think about unrest? How do we visualize it? So normally, as a social scientist, we will create maps like this, where we vary the color from light blue to dark blue to express how many protest events have happened over a particular time. So in this chart, you see that from 2016 to 2024, that most Iranian uh, periods of unrest, so think protests, uh, think even riots, but usually in this case, peaceful protests that are brutally repressed uh, by local militias and members of the regime, tend to be concentrated in urban areas. But this actually might not be the most important way to think about the current unrest, because you see that dark blue around Tehran, that's the same place you're seeing footage of actually traffic jams, miles of cars leaving, petro shortages, um, and even messages from Netanyahu entering into actually Iran itself, telling citizens to evacuate. So if we really want to understand in a particularly chaotic moment an authoritarian regime patterns of potential unrest and how it might evolve, we can't look at physical geography. We have to actually look at how people express their sentiment, their opinion, their emotions online. And to do that, we brought in one of our uh, non-resident researchers, Errol from Filter Labs, to help us understand how you actually map feelings online. Errol? So what you're seeing here is a chart basically that shows Iranian sentiment towards the supreme leader or the president and uh, Iranian sentiment towards faith in, in government. What is behind basically each one of these points is telling you that there is a URL, there is a specific artifact that if you click on it, it will take you to an Iranian news article or a telegram post and what we are seeing here, this is 13 June, so this is when things uh, kicked off. Unsurprising here that you see a lot of artifacts starting to, to come into the space, into the online Iranian space. What I wanted to draw your attention to is these basically, if it's red, it means it's the post itself, our AI tools, primarily natural language processing, our AI tools think that this is uh, the tone of that artifact is more negative. Yellow, green, stoplight chart, green more positive, red more negative. <clears throat> so if you look at this chart, what you're seeing is there's not a whole lot of negative sentiment related uh, posts online in the Iranian uh, online environment before this about the Supreme Leader. What you see is not just this cluster here, a lot of which is, is negative in tone. What you see, and this is I think what the Supreme Leader is not gonna like, what you see is that this has continued in the four days since, that, since the conflict popped off. And that sort of negativity did not exist before. As somewhat of a control and an, and an interesting point, the Iranians tend to have pretty good faith in their government through this tumultuous time. There's not increased negativity towards the government in general, but there is towards the Supreme Leader himself. And so Emily and Ben, this is something that we're gonna be watching very closely moving forward. So if that wasn't cool enough, what Arrow and I did was take the data. So think about the aggregate patterns and trends. Each one of those social media artifacts from Telegram to any one of the number of messaging apps. 
And we actually used it to train an AI agent alongside using RAG, a method for ingesting large volumes of texts by famous authors uh, in social theory and civic unrest, ranging from Max Weber, long since deceased, to more modern scholars like James Scott and Erica Chenoweth. So we could have a robust logical framework or a knowledge ontology to actually make sense of this shifting data pattern. And what that means, and this is something we do a lot at Futures Lab, it's novel uses of data. We could take this plus that AI agent and actually ask it to predict how this might evolve. So I want to quickly introduce to you two of the scenarios that this came up with. The first scenario really targeted on this idea of focusing on the supreme leader. So when we trained the AI model on those theories and gave it this data, it came up with a scenario entitled targeted delegitimation. And what it said is that public anger, anger is no longer diffuse, meaning it's no longer just about the economy, about society. It begins to become increasingly personal and focused. And it says that you'll start to see chants, social media posts, and even um, other reactions to Israeli strikes explicitly link the devastation in Tehran, which is likely to increase in the short term, directly to the delegitimacy of the supreme leader. And what's interesting is that the AI model linked this to Max Weber, who I mentioned, by highlighting a, a charismatic um, theocratic authority is actually really strong until they're not meaning they're brittle, meaning that there is a possibility that there's a threshold that this starts to signal where people will no longer view one charismatic leader who oversees a very complex political economic system, um, but that the delegitimacy of the supreme leader all of a sudden shifts to a classic revolutionary frame. And that's where it brought in the work of Ted Robert Gore, Why Men uh, Rebel. And this idea that Gore had in the 1970s, relative deprivation, was that his people's perception, frustration, aggression, hypothesis, is actually what drives widespread unrest. And for Gore, there's a particular tipping moment where people's perception is no longer just blaming a faceless regime, it's blaming one man and holding that one man accountable for their frustration. It unlocks a psychological trigger that means uh, you have more people willing to protest, more people willing to riot. So this first scenario, targeted de delegitimation, takes this particular trigger that Filter Labs found and imagines that even though people are leaving Tehran, you will likely see a cascade of small protests popping up all over country. Now, we shift to the second scenario because whenever you do scenarios, there is no one future. The further out you go, there's a spectrum. Um, we had the AI model also use this data and the models to imagine. And there it came up with something very different. And it was called evacuation, psychology, and quiet collapse. Meaning the AI really focused, because we loaded current uh, news in as well, on the evacuations from Tehran. And it saw those in relation to this idea of the work of James Scott and Weapon of the week, that sometimes people don't go and push on a police officer or a militia or you know burn a building, that actually regimes die slowly through quiet acts of protest because people are rational. They want to survive. If you go out in public and you shout death to the supreme leader, you're probably disappearing. So you have to find clever ways in authoritarian regimes to do uh, basically conceal your actual preferences. So what you start to see in this is not a sudden break into widespread unrest, like the first scenario, you see that that all of a sudden people distancing themselves from the regime becomes more of a quiet cascading series of no protest events until all of a sudden you have widespread work stoppages and widespread civil disobedience movement. And interestingly enough, the AI model pivoted the most likely actor to kind of lead that moment, which wouldn't happen for months in scenario two, to Iranian women. Iranian women have actually been at the forefront of most modern civil unrest really in the last 10 years inside of Iran. And there's fascinating work by a lot of feminist scholars and others that looks at that as how Iranian women view the repression of their body and their lives and their personal choices as a manifestation of the illegitimacy of the leader. So what do we have here is two different scenarios. The first one, focused on this red cluster, views it as quickly translating, despite Israel continuing to attack into a series of calls for even more red dots as we go forward 
to death to the leader. And we have a second scenario that looks at a quieter but more insidious movement, where all of a sudden, within the next 30 to 90 days, we start to see women activists do quiet forms of unrest that allow them to start to gain momentum and challenge the regime at its literally weakest point. So this is a good example of how you can take data, actually empirical data, train models using a, a robust set of literature, and then use it to predict scenarios in a particularly chaotic moment to spark the type of analytical dialogue that policymakers need. Emily? Okay, so as the resident skeptic here, having watched Iranian history unfold for the last 20 or so years and seeing multiple protest movements come up and be brutally squashed, yeah. uh, particularly as you mentioned, the, the women who were protesting Mazen Amini's death, taking off their headscarves yeah. in public, uh, we've seen a lot of brutal repression. So, I mean, at my heart of hearts, you know, I really do hope that this is yeah. different. However, I'm expecting to see the repression show up. And what we're used to seeing in Iran is really this band right here, where there's very scattered data points. There's just not a whole lot to work with. But through what Errol's company has done and what other companies are doing too, you're seeing able an ability to pull out more really interesting pieces of data to get a more complete picture. I have a former colleague who used to say that Intel is not about collecting dots, it's really pointillism. So you take all these little data points and you hope that if you stand back and you squint at it, it, it forms a picture. So talk to me about your points, Errol. Why do you feel like these points are actually leading you in the right direction? Why are you trusting the data that you're getting out of Iran? Yeah, thanks for the data question. I'll leave the theory to <laughs> Dr. Jensen over here. <laughs> Um, so what you are seeing on the screen here is a product that we call Talisman. It's our sentiment um, product. Underneath this is a product called Ubiquity. Ubiquity, great name, right? Yeah, great name. Ubiquity is all about finding really, really high quality data. The philosophy there is the internet looks different everywhere and people interact with the internet differently everywhere, right? So if you are looking in a place like Tehran or even Iran wide, but really let's focus on a place like Tehran, you want to kind of paint a picture of what the internet looks like there. And that's what Ubiquity does for us. Mm -hmm. It looks at those hyper local sources of data. Um, again, online discourse, this could be social media, this could be news media, this could be chat rooms, uh, comment sections on YouTube videos, you name it. So what that is doing is we are pulling all of those sources that we have mm -hmm. and our AI agents are basically finding those sources for us through Ubiquity. <clears throat> and then what this is doing is we are querying, we're asking questions to that corpus of data that we have in Farsi and we're asking questions to it also in Farsi. Um, and what this is pulling is it's basically saying, okay, <clears throat> This article or this social media post had something that relates to the, the query terms that you used. And I, the AI machine, am analyzing it. And I think, based on everything that I've been trained on, that it is a positive or a negative or somewhere in between. And there's a sentiment score. So what you're seeing here is a negative one to one scale. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of a, a gradation. We like to focus not on the exact score, we like to focus on the trends. Mm. And clearly what we're seeing here is a trend of more information in the space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would love to take this model and go back to previous rounds of protest movements and see if you could see the same sort of flow through of the data. So uh, an interesting way to use AI to pull data evaluated from behind a closed wall in a country. So Ben, let's go to theory then. Yeah. So now you're taking some more sophisticated AI models looking at very sophisticated concepts in international relations theory. It's like, you know, 20 years ago sitting in my IR theory class and then also a computer sitting next to me and telling me, well, this is what you really should think. So tell me about how you trained your yeah. AI models to get to these two potential scenarios and what you think the AI got right or wrong. Sure, great question. Well, first, I think the best way to describe this, Emily, is we took ubiquity and in the space of less than an hour, took ubiquity to a two-year graduate program, if not a PhD program, <laughs> by loading the type of syllabi on social theory, on social unrest, everything from political science to economic to psychology, uh, as well as sociology. So if anything, this is kind of a layering, and it shows that modern agentic AI is actually about human judgment and making conscious choices of the sequence in which you train an AI agent and how you're structuring the output around a very narrow 
goal-oriented objective. Mm. So in this case, the goal-oriented objective was using kind of prompting techniques like chain of thought to structure it to think about, do you understand aggregate patterns of social unrest? So don't even bring up Iran yet. Say, do you understand the concept of unrest? Mm. As you begin to interact, and it's showing you it does, saying, okay, now do you understand um, recent events in Iran loading a, a, we loaded about 50 different news articles we rapidly scraped. Mm -hmm. Now, given your understanding of recent events and this graduate school we just took you through, now do you understand the data flows from Ubiquity? And taking some of the text-based output where Arrow had had Ubiquity rapidly do an LLM synthesis that describes the kind of pixelated patterns you see. So back to your point, takes the points and makes pointillism, mm -hmm. uh, makes a clear picture. And those pictures become scenarios. Now, I'd say a word of caution with any scenarios. Again, hard to see the future is, said Yoda and Yogi Berra. Um, what they mean by that is it's still in the making. And sometimes the more chaotic a, an environment is, the more degrees of freedom there are. The more possible choices that people can make, the more energy in the system, which means you actually really do want to intentionally select low probability, high, high consequence scenarios, mm -hmm. which is, a, as you know, an old fashioned analytical trade calf technique. And so if you think about it as low probability, high consequence, low probability because any given day, we could do a statistical extrapolation of the probability of unrest in the next month in Iran. And chances are, because it was looking more to historical data, it misses Ubiquity's insights about changes in public perception. Um, that's why you need this different technique. Now, by definition, that means it's likely getting it wrong. Mm. Because what a good alternative future scenario does is give you a portrait, that pointless portrait of a future, so the clever analyst can develop the type of indicators you'd need to watch to see are you trending towards or away from that scenario. So mm -hmm. I do think at a minimum, it got right to different trajectories, which is really what we asked. It would have gotten it wrong to me if it regurgitated the same scenario over and over again, trying to fit it into a box. Mm -hmm. But it was able to almost have a structured imagination of outcomes and give me two different worlds. And as an analyst, that's what I would want. If you and I were like sitting down and preparing the uh, PDB, the presidential daily brief, we would want those different scenarios and we would want those different indicators so that the principal and the senior leaders understood the chaos of the moment. Mm. You'd be very, you know, woe is the person who's making certain bets about a moment of uncertainty. So I think it, where it gets it wrong potentially is maybe in the level of granularity it goes to. But I actually think the two scenarios would be plausible enough. If this was brought to my desk, I would ask the analyst to refine that before we took it up for a brief. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And I mean, I see this really as super useful when it comes to driving a conversation. Yes. I've been in so many rooms, so many national security meetings where somebody is absolutely sure that this is the direction this is going uh, based on their 20 years yeah. of knowledge. And you know, you've got a me sitting there saying, I've been watching this for 20 years and no protest movement has ever worked. And then you have sort of the exercise you go through where you have a neutral outside party, which is yeah. whichever AI system that you're using, saying, think about this. Think about this potential and what kind of road marks we might see along the way to that actual scenario coming true. And it really does expand your mind. Um, also, I mean, I think that this picture is fascinating because you can see on the 13th of June how all of a sudden all of this silence really coalesces into a scream. Yeah. And that plus one and minus one, you can see there's a broad scope of opinions about the Supreme Leader, but boy, do they have opinions where before they were being pretty quiet. So. And we, we actually ran another one that you're not seeing here since you mentioned Iranian women and, and you mentioned Amini. There's actually a Masa Amini hashtag that's circulating on Telegram. Oh. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we're watching, we're careful about the predictive nature of, of our data, <clears throat> but there's real messaging out there that is drawing on that September 2022 um, pro protest movement that started then. Um, and so what we're seeing is, is this, some of this is individual posts, some of it is starting to be parroting other people's, mm -hmm. picking up other people's messaging. Yeah. And there was even one video again of, of people um, in the night in Tehran uh, yelling death to Hamani. There was a couple telegram rants that basically blame everything that's happening on the Supreme Leader himself. So again, each post in isolation doesn't tell us a whole lot, but as those start to pick up steam, mm -hmm. that starts to become interesting. Yep, as the sentiment grows, 
Uh, we will be watching it closely, of course. Well, thank you so much, gentlemen, for coming and explaining how you're using AI to really tackle these very difficult problems. And we will be watching this closely as the next two weeks or so unfold. And then perhaps the two years after that, we'll be looking very closely for data points that suggest that maybe things are going sideways.